Hello, this is Matt Leonard for The Foundry and in this video we're going to be looking at the camera tracker in Nucate and specifically at tracking in stills mode. So firstly, just a couple of guidelines. Firstly, a good track requires good photos and that's probably very obvious. That doesn't mean that you can't necessarily take photos with your iPhone, but if you've got something like a Canon or a Nikon standing by, something you can lay your hands on that's going to be a much better camera than a point and shoot, then definitely go with that. Also, the camera track has different requirements depending on the subject of the photographs. So you may shoot things in a slightly different way if you're shooting, say, an interior to if you were shooting an exterior. And we'll look at that in more detail in a moment. Also, once you've taken the photos, it's very important that you don't crop or transform them in any way. Also, you need to avoid any dramatic changes in scale and angle between your photographs. Now you need to make sure that you have a certain amount of overlap between each photo that you take. Somewhere between 20 and 25% is usually a good value to go for. You could obviously overlap more than that, but then there's going to be a lot of wasted space. So about 25% of the last picture in the next one is usually a good amount to go for. You also want to avoid tracking stills containing multiple occlusions because this can result in a confusing change between the photographs and can cause the tracker to fail sometimes. And finally, for key objects, you want to try and make sure that they're captured in three or possibly four photos. So if you are doing an inside of a room and there's a table that you really want to make sure that you have it tracked properly, make sure that that object appears in at least three or four photos as you are moving around the room and taking those stills. Now, as I said at the beginning, depending on what you're shooting will depend on how you go about taking the photos. For instance, if you're shooting a near flat object, say it's the side of a building, make sure that you shoot head on facing the subject or facing the building in this instance. What you don't want to do is stand in a fixed position and just position the camera facing to the left shoot a number of stills gradually moving to the middle and then the right. You actually want to physically go down to one end of the wall, take some pictures moving along until you get to the right hand far end. Also, if you're shooting 3D objects, make sure that you move around the object shooting photos for a minimum of 20 degrees or at least 16 shots for a full 360 degree rotation around the subject that you're taking. That would be if you're taking just say a single object on its own. And finally if you're shooting an interior such as inside of a room or something like that you want to shoot from the center of the room facing outwards take all your pictures so 16 20 pictures from the center of the room moving round and then you want to go to the perimeter of the wall facing inwards and then shoot some pictures as you kind of move around the edge of the room facing inwards. So if you were going with our 16 shots, that would mean that you'd have 16 shots in the middle rotating round and then 16 shots at the perimeter of the room facing inwards and moving around the room, giving you a total of 32 shots. Now, enough of the theory, let's move into actually tracking some still frames. So firstly, you can see I've got some photography here. and Let's just play it through so you can see what we've got. It's a series of stills of the side of a building here. You can see that we haven't been too careful in whether we've avoided people being in it. There's people all over the place walking around, but that really doesn't affect how this process works. And what we don't need to do, which is fantastic, is spend a lot of time masking them out. We can just leave them there as they are and just go straight ahead and use this series of stills to do this track. Okay, so now it's played through. You can see these are all the images we've got. And you can see as we've shot this front of the building we've stayed reasonably perpendicular to it and then when we get to the end where the main section is the main entrance you can see we've actually moved around that so we've got our stills first thing we obviously need to do is bring in our camera tracker so tab typing in camera tracker you can see it just drops in under the read node because I had that selected now the first thing I need to do is change the source from sequence, which is what we would normally be used to using, across to stills. Then we want to choose the range here. So I can open it up and you can see I can choose either the global range, which will do 
the entire range that our timeline is set to, a custom range which enables us to choose the range we're doing. We could choose input which is just going to the input of the uh, viewer so that's going to be fine or we could use a reference frame and we can then come in and choose specific frames from a sequence that we want to be these reference frames. So for instance if you shot 50 stills and you only wanted to use 40 of them you could go through each of those 40 and set a keyframe on those 40 useful frames that you want and then just ignore the other ones, the other 10 that you wouldn't want to use. What we're going to be doing is we're just going to go with a global which will just mean it will be based on the global time range and we can see what that looks like just by pressing S in the main node graph here and up comes our project settings and you can see here we have a global time range of 5752 to 5777 now this global range was set based on the first thing that I loaded into Nuke which happened to be the set of stills and that's why these numbers are as they are. If you had some other footage brought in and then you brought your stills in the global frame range would be different here. So you want to make sure if you're choosing global that you actually are getting the frame range that you want. What we've got here is exactly what we need so we're just going to leave it on global. Next up we may choose to set a mask if there was something in here such as some text that had been overlaid you know sometimes a camera can burn in the date or the time when the photo was taken. If you have something like that you could obviously make a mask set it to something like source alpha and then between the read node and the camera tracker you could just add a roto shape just to mask that out outputting that into the alpha channel or you could obviously come in and use the mask input for either the luminance or the alpha just coming in from the side okay so having done all that the next thing we really need to do is come across and have a look at settings now here we have a number of things that we can change that can help us to actually get the track done and how the features are being defined in that early stage of the tracking process Firstly, what we tend to want to do is click on Preview Features. This then shows us in the viewport exactly what's going to be tracked. And you can see that by these little tracking markers that are appearing here, these little orange crosses. I'm just going to press F in the viewer just so that we frame in. Now the first thing that we may choose to adjust is the number of features. Now 200 is really the minimum. The default 250 is a good number to go with but sometimes you may choose to up this as high as 500. I'm going to put this up to 300 and hopefully that will give us a good track. Next up we have this detection threshold and what this basically does is this determines how the distribution of features are going to occur across the image. If I put it down basically the tracking markers are more even across the image. If I increase it you can see that they kind of huddle slightly more together. A value of 0.1 which is the default is usually a good number to go with. Finally we have this feature separation below and this basically sets the distribution of features as they relate to each other. So if I reduce it down to say 2 what you'll notice is that all the markers are kind of huddling together and if I increase it to say 20 you can see they're really spread out across the image a lot more. So I'm going to set it again to the default of thereabouts 12. Finally we have this really useful feature which is refine feature locations and what this basically does is it locks the detected features to local corners. So if I zoom into this window you can see how the markers are across this bottom section. As I put refined feature locations on you can see that they very cleverly jump to these kind of corners that it's discovered. So this is a really nice feature to use when you might have this kind of thing in the image, some nice kind of corners to work to. Again I'm just going to zoom out and press F just to frame in to give me a nice view here. So from here I can come back to the camera tracker if I have the information regarding things like the focal distance or the film back size I could enter that here but for this example I'm just going to go ahead and press the track button to begin that process. Okay so that's finished up now what we're going to do next is come into the thumbnails in the viewer and we can come across and look at all of the tracks here 
and I can just adjust this up and down to increase or decrease the size. I can click and drag with my left mouse button looking through the frames and if I wanted to jump to one I can just double click on it and that will load it into the main part of the viewer. Also if I wanted to I could look at the ones that have been specifically tracked or user tracks if I wanted to. I'm just going to leave it on all for the time being. So having got this far the next thing we want to do is just solve the camera. So I'm just going to in the main camera tracker tab click solve. Now that's finished you can see that we have a solve error of 4.95. Now usually that may be considered quite a high number but what you need to remember is we're tracking 5k plates here so that actually isn't too bad but we still need to get that down if we can. So we're going to jump across to the auto track section and see if we can refine our track at all. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to come to the RMS and the max track error and I'm going to choose the max track error by holding down control or command just to select the second option. I'm going to press in this section here F to frame in. And you can see at the top we have this line that represents the position of this slider down here. So I can move this up and down and as I begin to move it down what we're basically doing is we're clipping off data that we may choose to ignore. And then if you look in the viewer you can see that some of these tracking points have now turned red. That basically means that we're just going to reject those. So I've reduced it down a little bit. We're also going to come to the error max. Command or control click the max error. And I might choose to reduce this down a little bit as well. I don't want to go too far, just a little bit. What we can now do is we can choose to delete the rejected ones and I'm just going to say yes and if we had any unsolved ones which would basically come up as orange I could choose to delete those as well. So I'll just do that now. Straight away you can see that our solve error has now reduced down to 4 which is really pretty good. I'm now going to come back to the camera tracker tab and I'm just going to solve again just to make sure that those changes are taken into account. So we'll just do that and that will just take a few seconds to run through. Now that's finished you can see the error has reduced down to 3.37 which is a good number for this kind of resolution that we're working to. So I'm just going to turn off the thumbnails back to hide. Now I'm going to come across to my export. I'm going to export scene plus which basically gives me everything I could possibly want with the exception of cards and I'm going to click create. I'm just going to move my viewer now down to the scanline render. Select that by pressing number 1 once the scanline render is selected. And if I then move my cursor up to my viewer and press the tab button, I move into my 3D view. And you can see there is my point cloud of my still frame track. Now if we wanted to, we could export some cards based on each camera position as well. So we simply come across again to the export in the camera tracker, choose cards and again press create. And what you'll notice is this creates a group out the side of the camera tracker. If I select it and press number one on the keyboard again moving my viewer across to that, you can see that now we have many cards. It takes a few moments just for those to fill in with the images, but this can be really useful again for reference. Now if you're wondering what on earth's going on here, the card, as I said, is a group, and if we double click on that, we can come into the S, which is to show the internal structure, open that up, and you can see these are all of the frames with the correct still frame on and the camera, just so you can see exactly what's going on here. For the time being, though, we're just going to move back to the node graph, and let's just return again before the end of the video just to look at that point cloud. Now if we play, you can see there is the camera moving across, positioning itself where each photograph was originally taken. So that brings us to the end of this video, looking at the camera tracker working in stills mode. This has been Matt Leonard for The Foundry.